Chapter 7, Not Clarice What do you know about the Candleman? asked Theo. He had collapsed, exhausted, into a silk-covered beanbag chair in Not Clarice's attic room. After their escape from their pursuers in the network, she had swiftly headed back to the surface and taken him to a narrow but elegant old house in a tree-lined street not far from Buckingham Palace. Oh, nothing, said Not Clarice quickly. Who's he? One of the fairy tale stories Mr. Nicely is always reading you. There was a playful, mocking tone in her voice that Theo didn't quite know how to deal with. Why did you ask me to take my gloves off and run at those men? Theo asked. Not Clarice drew back a lily-patterned curtain and frowned at the gloomy view of the gaunt mansions across the road. It was now a dismal afternoon, only two o'clock, but the dreary city cityscape seemed to be already yearning for dusk. A faint mist softened the shapes of the stark winter trees. Well, they kept putting it about that you had a hideous disease, or I thought we could make that work for us. Theo fell silent. Hungry? asked not Clarice. Have you got millet and greens? asked Theo. No, the girl replied. I'll go and see what there is. You rest. She disappeared downstairs, and Theo admired her exotic world. There was a painting of a beautiful woman in a long, fashionable gown, and an, ebo an ebony s sculpture of a cat, a half-eaten box of dark chocolates. To Theo, these things were every bit as strange as the skeleton in the watchtower and the canals in the network. Theo sank into his luxurious beanbag and gave a miserable sigh. Life had been awful at Empire Hall, but outside it was plain scary. Not Clarice came back up with a plate of blue cheese, crumbly biscuits, and a pink cake. She had also made hot tea, which no sensible person would ever do. The dangers of that overstimulating brew had been made very clear to him at Empire Hall. If you don't say anything, then I'll be able to talk to you, Theo said, feeling a draft from the window and hugging his knees. You mean, pretend I'm Clarice, said not Clarice. Theo nodded shyly. It's nice of you, I suppose, to rescue me, said Theo, breaking off a tiny corner of biscuit to nibble. But things have seemed to have gone wrong. Magnus is too old and Sam is strange and disturbing to begin with. Not Clarice laughed at this. We can't contact the council, Theo continued, so we can't find out who I am or what to do next. That's pretty important, as I have a terrifying condition and I really shouldn't be running around free in the outside world. Soon, for the first time in my life, I will have gone twenty-four hours without being in the mercy tube. It's all looking a bit grim. He took a deep breath. He was just making things worse. It was appalling manners to keep talking about yourself, the least important person in the world. He stuffed a pink cake in his mouth and swallowed greedily. And now I'm with you, he added. And the only thing I know about you is who you aren't. The girl sighed and rose to switch on a lamp. Theo noticed that she dressed in fine materials. Her dark dress and jacket seemed new and splendid, things that, like things that had always been at Empire Hall. Not Clarice might be from the secret society, but she is definitely coming from a different world than Sam and Magnus. Everything at the cemetery's cottage had been chipped, tatty, old, or smelly. Certain things didn't quite seem to fit together to Theo, and he wanted a few answers. Are we safe here? Theo asked. After the watchtower turned out to be not so secret after all, I thought it best to avoid anywhere connected with a society of unrelenting vigilance, she said. In case we've been betrayed by someone, this is just a room a friend keeps for me. He's away, she added vaguely. If you're not Clarice, then who is? asked Theo. Well, Clarice is, the girl replied. She's my twin sister. I'm Chloe. We were separated when we were only toddlers, after our mum died. Clarice, who was born deaf, went into an orphanage and was chosen to serve the Society of Good Works. It was a great opportunity, opportunity for the unrelenting vigilance. They adopted me and brought me up a fine lady. She grinned at this to show Theo she was making light of a longer story. It meant they could swap me over with Clarice sometimes and get a good look at the enemies. Who are the two society's enemies? Theo butted in. Chloe swigged the extremely dark tea. 
The all goes back to Victorian times. A very devious man knows the philanthropist set up the Society of Good Works. This organization pretended to be a charity, but really it was just a front for a bunch of creepy villains. The society taught orphans to steal, widows to be assassins, and sick beggars to pass illnesses on to their enemies. Even the police fell under the power. They had London in a grip of terror. In the end, some of the victims of the Society of Good Works, the people who had suffered at their hands, got together to form a secret alliance, the Society of Unrelenting Vigilance. Since then, we have been watching, striving to stop this so-called charity from doing its evil work. Theo's head was spinning. Had he really grown up in the heart of such a sinister society? He felt anxious and miserable. I... I don't think Dr. Sane is just evil, Theo said very quietly, as if frightened of being heard and contradicted. He's... he's certainly a very clever man with brilliant ideas, Theo stopped. Chloe didn't reply. She was cheerfully brushing her hair, as if preparing to go out again. I suppose I haven't really known enough people to compare him with, Theo added sadly. Chloe gave Theo a sympathetic look. I tried to find out what makes him tick, she said. Our society took certain carefully chosen mourns to swipe me over with Clarice and get a peek inside Empire Hall. Theo felt a tingle of enlightenment down his spine. He knew at last he was getting to some of the mysteries. So sometimes you were looking after me, he gasped. Once or twice, she said. What did you find out? Not much, Chloe replied. Even though they thought I was deaf, they never gave anything away. At Empire Hall, they speak in a kind of code all the time. Looking after poor Theo meant locking you away. Because of my illness, Theo said. Yes, mused Chloe, frowning deeply. She looked at Theo. Do you think there's anything wrong with you? Or was it all a trick, an excuse to hide you away? I... I don't know, Theo said. His mind was racing. If he touched people, they melted. Did that count as an illness? Could he really trust this strange girl who wasn't Clarice and her odd friends who had spirited him out of his old life and plunged him into a frightening new one? All right, Chloe sighed. It's tricky. I admit this probably isn't looking like the greatest rescue ever. Magnus will find a way to contact me when he's safe. In the meantime, there's something positive we can do. What's that? Find out if you really do have a disease, or if your guardians are just a bunch of liars. There was a beep from the street outside. Well, here's our taxi, Chloe said. Theo had been in a taxi before, with Mr. Nicely. It was one of the best things in the world. The London he usually only saw in picture books became dizzyingly to life as the cab navigated through the afternoon traffic. Glowing shops and bustling streets gave way to the hush and solemnity of wealthy mansions as they approached their destination. Now, why is Sam disturbing? asked Chloe, smiling. Theo gazed out of the window into an increasingly thick and nasty fog. He's one of those people who wants to be happy, said Theo. I see, said Chloe, and that's wrong because... The pursuit of happiness makes people selfish said Theo. It causes friction in society and leads to a morbid fear of death. I see. Chloe wrapped a big cream-colored scarf around her face, and Theo couldn't see if she was smiling or not. If people really enjoy life, they won't ever want it to end, he added, remembering some lectures from his guardian. Wow, the Society of Good Works shed did its work on you, she muttered. And Sam throws jelly beans into the air and catches them in his mouth added Theo. That is bad, Chloe sighed. They were dropped off at the tall, shining metal gates of a stately red brick building in a quiet square off Harley Street. Chloe had to peer closely at a damp, speckled brass nameplate because the murky fog was getting thicker. She pressed a buzzer. It's just like that ghastly mist we found seeping out of the central canal in the network, said Chloe. Maybe it followed us up here, Theo remarked. For him, fantastical things were just as possible as real things. He had never been encouraged to distinguish between the two. Soon, a distorted voice invited them to identify themselves. We have an appointment to see Sir Peregrine Arbogast, Chloe said into the security intercom. It's Chloe Miles and Luke Anderson. 
The electric gates swung slowly open. They crunched up the gravel drive of the enormous house. Thick evergreens towered overhead, dripping dirty fog. I'm just giving you a pretend name, Chloe said. Just in case. My name is pretend anyway, said Theo. In case of what? Think of it as a game. A wrinkled, overly made-up secretary showed them through the large marble waiting room, with an enormous stuffed owl on a plinth in the middle. There was a beautiful relief carved into the stone wall of Noah's Ark and the animals coming in two by two. Theo frowned. Funny, he remarked, gazing at the picture. Most of the animals in that scene are the ones that never made it into the Ark, like the giant sloth and the unicorn. Suddenly he grinned. Oh look, there's a Sevatharium. Can we focus a bit here? said Chloe, who had never heard of a Sevatharium. We're going to meet the, the great Sir Peregrine Albergast, and he is going to examine you. Is he in unrelenting vigilance? asked Theo. Shh! urged Chloe, alarmed. No, he isn't, and don't mention them again. Sir Peregrine is a respected expert on unusual conditions. I pulled a few strings to get him to meet you, as he's sort of a semi recluse. Be careful what you say to him. Why do we have to see him? Theo asked. Well, if you really have got a terrible disease, we need to know as soon as possible, so I can avoid catching it, Theo said. Theo's heart sank. Chloe was more worried about herself than him. She didn't seem to understand what a critical moment this was. Suppose this expert found out that Theo could kill people, and called the police to take him away. Suppose it turned out that everything Dr. Sane had said was right, and Theo had to go back into the mercy tube tonight. Luke Anderson? called a nurse's voice from down a dark corridor nearby. Theo arose, feeling as if he had just been summoned for an execution.